actually is in Psalm, the book of Psalm. Amen. The book of Psalm 78, the 78th number of Psalm. And we're grateful for our pastors who are here, uh, Robinson and, and, and Lewis and Taylor who are here with us and all of these preachers in the pulpit and the pew. I thank God for members of our diaconate ministry uh, who are with us and visiting um, officers and uh, this great music ministry and ushers and each of you, my heavenly father's children, amen. Some of my ministers' wives are here, Sister Hall and others. Certainly, we are grateful to God for all of our visitors as well. There's a word I want to share, Psalm 78. If you can look at verse 9 through 11, Psalm 78, verse 9 through 11, amen. Psalm 78, verse 9 through 11. I want to read this morning, particularly from the King James um, translation of the Bible today. And there is this little obscure scripture uh, that's nestled in this text, and I just want to kind of extract it today and share it with you this morning. For those of you that have it and for those that shall find it, these words are recorded. The children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. And they kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had showed them. You may be seated in the very presence of the Lord. Let me read that one more time. The children of Ephraim, they were armed. And the Bible says, and carrying bows. However, in the day of battle, the Bible says they turned back. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law. And most importantly, they forgot his works and his wonders that he had already showed them. I, I won't preach uh, this morning with our same general theme of doing it God's way from these words, facing battles God's way. Turn to your neighbor, look him or her in the eye and say, neighbor, face your battles God's way. Amen. Amen. Give God praise in this place in advance for the word facing battles. Ushers, you may be seated in the very presence of the Lord. I, as I mentioned in, 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 in my opening statement that our text this morning, our sermonic spotlight, it, it shines on an excerpt from this somewhat unfamiliar psalm to some of us and contained within this 78th number of psalm that there's an obscure passage of scripture that, that has little historical reference, but it has great practical relevance. When you look at this 78th number of psalm, it is regarded as a teaching psalm or a historical psalm. Asaph, the writer of this particular narrative, is, is writing this particular psalm with one express intention in mind. He is writing to warn the people of Judah to not imitate their faithless ancestors or their idolatrous neighbors in the northern kingdom. Asaph is writing this psalm with the express intent to teach the current generation of believers of that day to not make the same mistake as their forefathers made. Th th this is a teaching psalm. Tell your neighbor, it's a teaching psalm. Asaph's intention was to pour into the current generation of believers so that they in turn could share this word with their children and the children's children. It was the German philosopher Hegel who said the one thing that we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Suggesting that one of the perils of, 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 of our culture is that we fail to learn from the mistakes that our ancestors have, have made in the past. ASAP, in the process of reviewing the history of his people, he saw a sad record of forgetfulness and faithlessness. He saw a sad trend of foolishness and failure, and he sought to understand 
not only what it meant, but he sought to correct it. Therefore, his intent in this particular narrative, my brothers and my sisters, is to teach his current context, the children, the believers of his day, to get them to a point wherein they could simply trust God. His, his aim, and don't miss this, his aim in writing this particular narrative is, is to get them to a point in their faith in God and their walk with God to, to, to know that in every situation, God will have their back. His aim, and I want you to write this down for those who are taking notes, his aim, my brothers and my sisters, in this narrative is to get them to a point in their walk with God that they would be able to face battles that come their way. And I want to talk about that for a moment because in this life you will have to face some battles. In fact, I'm talking to somebody right now who's in a battle right now and your battle might not be like mine, and mine might not be like yours, but somebody under the sound of my voice have been battling all week long. And Asaph's aim in this narrative, Demetrius, was to get them to, regardless of what they were going through, to get them to the point that they could face their battles. Encourage your neighbor, tell them you can face your battles. You, you can do it. You can, you, you can do it, and I don't know. Who I'm talking to, but I feel in my spirit that somebody came on the verge of throwing up the, the white flag or throwing in the towel because the battle is, is getting so difficult and so rough. But Asaph's aim in this text was to let them know that if God brings you to it, God can get you through it. Tell someone beside you, God can get you through. God can get you through in this Sometimes it's hard trusting God when there's no frame of reference when you are talking to people and people seemingly can't understand what you are going through when you trying to relate to people and there's no one in your current context you feel that knows what you're going through and when you can't find any horizontal help still know in your spirit that God will give you the strength that you need to get through whatever it is he brought you to. I think I better mention this parenthetically, that regardless of how hard you try not to have them and how much you try to live a life so pleasing to God to get around them, you are going to have to battle sometime. And to illustrate this particular point, Asaph takes a page out of history and he talks about the children of Ephraim. And this, this, this phrase, Ephraim, or the children of Ephraim, really uh, just denotes the northern kingdom. And he describes their inability to face battles. Listen at what he says. And it really arrested my attention. See, so he says that the children of Ephraim, they were armed and carrying bows, got to the battlefield in the day of battle and the bible says they turned their back P -p please listen at what it says the, uh, asaph says there came a day when when, when the children of of, of ephraim um, ha had a battle that they were facing and and the text says they were armed they had arrows they, they had every advantage over the adversary L look at what they have going for them the first thing that they have going for them is uh, they have ancestry on their side they are the children of ephraim can the church just shout Ephraim Ephraim was uh, have a history uh, you those that know your history Ephraim was one of the sons of Joseph uh, he, he named his boys one Manasseh and the other one uh, Ephraim and and he named his son watch this Ephraim because uh, uh, J Joseph was blessed in the land of Egypt when you go back and you read the book of Genesis you'll discover uh, that Joseph said that he named his son Ephraim because uh, God had blessed him in the land of his affliction in fact, those who are taking notes, the word Ephraim means 
doubly fruitful. In, in other words, Ephraim means the favor of God multiplied. Ephraim means a, a, a doubly fruitful, meaning this, that the children of Ephraim should have walked in favor. They should have walked in fruitfulness. They, 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 they had favor in their footsteps. They had favor in their history. The, the, the name Ephraim suggests that God was on their side. The, the, the name Ephraim suggests that in their history, God has been a provider for them. So when they showed up on the battlefield, they showed up with ancestry on their side. Secondly, the Bible says in this text that when they showed up on the battlefield, they showed up wearing armor. They, 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 they're dressed for battle. They, they, they have the wardrobe for the war. They, 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 they are clothed for conflict. The Bible says uh, uh, when they got to the battlefield, they were already dressed. Suggesting they had the helmet of salvation on. Suggesting they had the breastplate on, the, 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 the shield, the sword, the sandal, the belt. Suggesting that on the outside appearance they were ready for conflict. And not only did they have arrows on their uh, ancestors on their side and armor on their side. But AJ, the text suggests that they even had arrows. That even if the enemy was a great distance off, they could still fight in the battle they were prepared for close conflict but even if the conflict was remote they were prepared for the battle they, they, they had armor they had arrows they had ancestry but when things got hot y'all ain't hearing me when, uh, when, when when the battle started raging when things started getting chaotic when it looked like they were going to have to engage in warfare the Bible says instead of facing the battle, they turned back and fled from the battle. Y'all got to hear me this morning. They had everything at their disposal. Every advantage over the adversary was right at their disposal. Can I park there for a moment and just speak to somebody in this house today that contrary to popular belief, you have everything at your disposal. I wish y'all let me preach in this house. Contrary to popular belief, God has already given you every weapon, every tool. God has already equipped you with every strategy, every scheme, uh, every mechanism. God has already put at your disposal everything that you need to be. It is a trick of the enemy to make you think that you cannot make it. It is a trick of the, I'm going to talk to somebody in this house. It is a trick of the adversary to make you think that you're not strong enough. It's the trick of the adversary to make you think you don't have enough word in the reserve. It's a trick of the adversary to make you think you don't have the tools or the technique. The devil is a liar. It is a trick of the adversary to make you feel that you are not wise enough, strong enough, anointed. The devil is the liar. You are so strong, so anointed, so gifted, have so much word that everything the devil has tried prior to now has failed to work because of that fact if you didn't have the tools Lord let me preach if you didn't have the technique if you didn't have the armor didn't have the armor, the arsenal didn't have the an advocate didn't have the skills didn't have the anointing you would have thrown in the towel a long time if you didn't have what it took the last time the devil attacked you you would have waved the white flag and thrown in the towel but the fact that you're still here Lord, let me preach today. The fact that you have taken a licking. Tell your neighbor, I'm still ticking. I'm still, still ticking. Yeah, sometimes I got to cry, but I'm still here. Sometimes I got to walk the floor, but I'm still here. Sometimes I doubt God, but I'm still here. Sometimes I get discouraged, but I'm still here. What concerned me, what concerned me in this analogy the Bible says in the day of battle, they turned back. That thing bothered me, Sherry, because I, I wanted to know how could a person have all of this on their side? Can I preach like I feel it? How, how can I show up on the battlefield? I have ancestry on my side. I have armor on my side. I have arrows in my hand. And still, when the enemy shows his ugly head, I turn my back and run. 
Well, I want to suggest that the answer is right here in the text. I, I, I want to suggest that they, that they, that they were uh, 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 unable to withstand the attack of the adversary. And, and, and fudge, the answer is right here in the text. Can I suggest that they made three fatal mistakes? Would suggest that you can have ancestry, you can have armor, and you can have arrows. But if you don't take advantage of the arsenal that God has provided for you, that if you make these mistakes, I don't care how much arrows you have, many arrows you have, how much armor you're wearing, how, how how strong your ancestry is. If you make these mistakes that they made, you will not be able to stand. When the enemy rush in like a flood, a standard will not not be lifted up if you make the I, I don't care how much prayer you pray how much church you attend how much tithe you give how much testimony you talk if you don't have these things in your life my brothers and sisters in the day of trouble instead of facing your battle you will flee from the battle what mistake did they make in this text let me hurry in this text Asaph said the first problem that they had was watch this they did not stay in covenant with God I wish somebody would write this down they didn't stay in covenant with God tell your neighbor say neighbor stay in covenant with God tell your other neighbor say neighbor you gotta stay in covenant with God look at the text the Bible says they kept not I ain't making this up I wish I had something deeper to give you this morning verse 10 is very plain they did not stay in covenant they kept not the covenant of God God is a God of covenant someone shout covenant God, God is not a God of convenience, but God is a God of covenant. What differentiates God from man is that our relationships are based on convenience, but God's relationship is based on covenant. We are so casual. We are so convenient. I, I like you because you like me. I do for you because you do for me. Our relationships are based on convenient. When it's convenient for me to show up, I'll show up. When it's convenient for me to tie, I'll tithe. When it's convenient for me to serve, I'll serve. When it's convenient for me to go the extra mile, I'll go the extra mile. When it's convenient for me, if I feel like it, if the stars line up, if my car crank, if I have gas in the tank, if I have money in my pocket, when it's convenient for me, but guess what? God is not a God of convenient. God is a God of Aren't y'all glad that God don't treat us like we treat one another? Because convenient, it speaks of a condition. But God's love is unconditional. I'm, I'll shout all by myself. I praise God that God is not a God of convenient, but a God of covenant. Because, he, because since he's a God of covenant, there are times when I don't deserve to be blessed. But because he is a covenant God, he still blessed me. There are times when I don't deserve favor, but because he's a God of covenant, God looks at my fault and still bless me anyway. I guess I'm in here by myself. I praise God that we serve a God of covenant. Tell your neighbor he's a God of covenant. A covenant is a written agreement or a promise usually under seal between two or more parties especially for the performance of some kind of action it is a binding agreement can the church shout covenant every time the bible uses the word covenant it is talking about god's response god's relationship with man the first time we hear this word covenant mentioned in the bible it is in genesis uh, chapter number six when god uh, told noah he was making a covenant with him god then tells abraham him. he was making a covenant with him God tells you and I today that he is in covenant with us and just like in every contractual agreement whenever God makes a covenant he spells out the parameters of that covenant God is always specific about what he'll do and what he expects us to do you see when God makes a covenant with his people that covenant uh, spells out the expectations of God God knows never makes a covenant without becoming specific about what he is expecting out of us and what he we can expect out of him let me give you a good example go to the book of Deuteronomy 
Come on, very quickly, go to the book of Deuteronomy. Um, let's start with verse number one. Go to the book of Deuteronomy. Everyone flip. Come on, very quickly, go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number one. Deuteronomy, chapter number 28, verse one. Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verse number one. Let me give you a good example of a covenant agreement between God and his people. When you look at Deuteronomy, are y'all still here? Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, beginning at verse number 1, uh, God puts it like this, And it shall come to pass, if thou wilt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord, to obey all, to, 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 to observe and to do all his commandments, my covenant, which I'm commanding this day, that the Lord God will set up. God says, uh, if you will fulfill the covenant agreement, meaning keep my commandments, God says, I'll do certain things for you. God says, all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you uh, if you would hearken to the voice if you would just keep my covenant can the church say keep my covenant God says there are covenant blessings verse 3 you will be blessed in the city you'll be blessed in the field verse 4 uh, blessed shall be the fruit of your body and the fruit of your ground the fruit of your cattle verse 5 blessed will be your basket and thy store verse 6 blessed shall thou be when you come in blessed will you be when you go out look at verse number 7 then the Lord says I'm going somewhere then uh, the Lord shall cause your enemies watch this that rise up against you to be smitten before your face they shall come out against you one way but watch this they shall flee from you uh, seven different ways stop right there look at verse 7 this is a part of the covenant can the church shout the covenant the covenant agreement between God and his people and Pastor Taylor, a part of the covenant covers us in the time of conflict. God says that if we are in covenant, I'm going somewhere, one with another, when conflict comes up, you don't have to worry about conflict because the contract covers you in the conflict. Y'all ain't hearing me. God says that you don't have to worry about the conflict because if you keep the contract uh, when you are confronted with conflict I'll keep you covered in fact when the enemy come at you one way I'll make them flee from you seven different ways however flip down to verse number 12 because when you get to verse number 12 rather verse 15 but the Bible says but if you don't keep my word if you don't keep my commandments if you break the contract then curses will overcome you and from from verse 16 down to verse 68 talks about the curses that's going to come upon us look at verse 25 of Deuteronomy chapter 28 because one of those curses is this the Lord shall curse thee to be smitten before thou enemies and thou shalt go out against them and flee several ways before them and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth in other words God says I'll flip the script if you don't keep my contract in the time of conflict when you face the enemy you won't have success against them why because you have broken my covenant are y'all hearing me today well flip back to our text because here is the problem in the narrative here it is if Ephraim has failed to keep the covenant agreement between them and God and because they have broken the contract in the day of conflict they have no confidence here it is because they have broken the covenant agreement between them and God when the enemy comes up against them they don't have confidence because the contract between them and God has been broken I ain't got no help in this house you see the difference between Ephraim and Joshua is this Joshua was not afraid to go up against the adversary because God told Joshua if this book of the law don't depart from your mouth and if you don't to turn from the book from to the left or to the right uh, no man will be able to stand up against thee uh, all the days of your life I'm talking to somebody right now because there's somebody right now who's at the point that you're not afraid of your enemies uh, because you recognize uh, if 
you stay uh, in the contract in the day of the conflict you can have confidence in fact I'm talking to somebody right now when your haters come up against you when the adversary tries to depress you when folk come up against you trying to steal your joy all you do is stand on the word of God and declare no weapon formed against me is going to prosper not because I'm afraid of you but because I'm in line with the covenant agreement between God and God promised me he would fight my battle he promised me he would make my enemies my footstool he promised me that when the enemy comes in like a flood he would Lord let me preach Okay, 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 let me hurry, let me hurry. Y'all ain't feel me today. Let me hurry, let, let, let me hurry. Number one, number one, number one. The Bible says, the Bible says, here it is, Israel, Ephraim rather. They're going up against the adversary. Please don't miss this. They have everything on their side. They have ancestry. Y'all going to get this today. They have ancestry on their side because they are the children of Ephraim. They have armor on their side because when they show up on the battlefield, they're already dressed for conflict then they have arrows in their hand they have offensive weapons the arrows and defensive weapons the armor however when the enemy comes in the bible says they turn their back and they run pastor why did they run they ran number one because they did not keep covenant with god but secondly they ran because they did not stay in contact with god tell your neighbor says neighbor Whatever you do, stay in contact with God. Look at the text. The Bible says, watch this, they refuse to walk in his law. The New International Version says they refuse to live by his law. The Message Bible says they refuse to walk by the word. When the Bible suggests that they refuse to walk in his law, that speaks of their disobedience. Can I teach this morning? Can the church just shout disobedience? Disobedience disconnects us from God. Oh, it's kind of quiet in this house. I'm going to say that one more time. Disobedience disconnects us from God. Are y'all hearing me? When we refuse to hearken to the will and to the word of God, that failure to comply causes our closeness to the creator to be interrupted. That whenever we choose to walk not according to the word of God or to the law or to the statue of God, we are choosing to act in disobedience. And whenever we are disobedient, disobedience disconnects. Tell your neighbor, say neighbor, disobedience disconnects. It is as if you're on your cell phone and the call drops. And you call the person back and say, I don't know if it was my phone or your phone, but I lost you. Come on, help me, somebody. Well, when the communication is cut off between you and God, you don't have to wonder who, 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 what the problem is. The problem is not on God's end. The problem is where he never loses his signal. Come on, talk to me, somebody. He, he, he never experiences a failure. The problem is on our end because disobedience always disconnects. Are y'all hearing me? And the most frightening moment, the most, the, 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 the scariest moment in your life, my brothers and sisters, uh, is not when you are confronted uh, with chaos. It is when you are cut off from the creator. The, 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 the most dangerous time in your life uh, is when you lose your contact with God. The loneliest moment is not when your children are not there, when your spouse is not there, when you're in between jobs or blessings, but the most loneliest time you can have in your life is when you feel that you have lost contact and communication with God. I discovered something the other day about the space shuttle that whenever the space shuttle is reorbiting from outer space, there's a point in that process when the shuttle lose all contact with NASA. And astronauts have gone on record by saying that when that happens, the most dangerous moments, that's the most dangerous moment in the flight. I thought that was interesting because one of the astronauts testified and said that his most frightening moment in the voyage is not during a takeoff. It's not doing the re-entry from outer space. It's not walking on the moon. It's not repairing the shuttle or repairing the space station. But he testified that the most frightening moment uh, is when they lose contact with NASA. And I questioned uh, how long is that interruption? And I kept reading the article and I discovered that he testified 
testified that while the disconnect only lasts for a few moments, he went on record by saying one moment is too long not to have contact with life support. I ain't got no help in this house. Can I talk to somebody in this house? That one moment is too long to go without knowing that there's a contact between you and God. One moment, y'all ain't hearing me. One moment is too long to know that some type of interruption has taken place. And whenever we sin and walk in disobedience, that disobedience disconnects us from God. You're looking at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. And I knew I wasn't going to get no amens, but I brought one with me. Come here, David. David says, you're right, Pastor Jackson. And it's like flip to Psalm 51 very quickly. I promise I'm almost finished. Flip to Psalm number 51. Flip to your left. When you read Psalm 51, I, I, I love this Psalm of David, this Psalm 51. And not, not, not because David is magnifying or glorifying sin, but, but I love this Psalm 51 because what it does, Daryl, is this. Uh, it talks about uh, David's transparency and David talks about the effect that sin has on a saint. He talks about, watch this, the effect that sin has on a saint. Tell your neighbor, says, neighbor, sin has an effect on the saint. Yes, sin has an effect on the y'all. I'm going to say it one more time. Sin has an effect on the saint. And while the effect that sin has on the saint is not the severing of the saint's salvation, however, sin does have an effect on the saint. Meaning this, we believe and we are confident that once we are saved, nothing can sever our salvation. So sin, please hear me closely, sin does not have an effect, Tanya, on our salvation salvation but sin does affect the saint in fact let me give you three ways it affects the saint first of all look at verse number seven the first effect that sin has on the saint is sin soils the soul of a saint after david sinned after david messed up david's soul had been stained by sin in fact david felt dirty david felt unworthy he could wash in the nile he can wash with the best soaps but david still felt filthy not on the outside Side, but filthy on the inside because my brothers and my sisters when we sin we can clean up the outside when we sin we can wipe the dust and the dirt off the outside we can put on nice beautiful hats and nice black suits come to church and sit in the saint like we ain't never done it wrong but something on the end there's a stench that the soul emits that only the nostrils of God can smell here it is David says Lord I have messed up and I recognize that my soul Sin soils the soul. Look at what he says. He says, purge me with his hyssop and I shall be clean. Why? Because he recognized that sin has an effect on saints. And the first effect that sin has on the saint is that sin soils the soul. Tell your neighbors, there's neighbor. Sin soils the soul. But then look at verse 11. He says not only does sin soils the soul of a saint. But verse 11 he says sin separates the saint from the Savior. He says listen Lord I know that when I messed up I didn't just mess up against Uriah. I didn't mess up against Bathsheba. But guess what Lord my sins are ever before your face. So what God I want you to cast me not away from your presence and take me not take your spirit not away from me. Why, Ludens? Because uh, sin has a way of separating me from God. Watch this. It don't separate God from me, but me from God. God is always there, but when I sin, I feel like I can't get to him. No matter what I do, he can always get to me. Hey. I feel like preaching today. However, when I sin, I mess, I feel as if I can't get to God. And so here it is in the text. David says sin has an effect on the saint. Are y'all getting all this? And the first effect that sin has on the saint is that sin sorrows the soul of a saint. Secondly, sin separates the saint from the sovereign. But then thirdly, sin steals the song from the saint. In other words, you can't have joy walking in disobedience. Listen at what he says in verse 12. He says, God, restore unto me, not my salvation. I got that. But God, I ain't got no joy. Meaning this, God, I know I'm saved. But when I come to church, I don't feel the joy. I, I know I got a relationship. But when I come to church, I hear the choir singing. 
but it don't move me like it used to move me because I done lost my joy because the effect that sin has on the saint is that it steals the song it steals the joy it steals the enthusiasm you can tell when your joy has been affected because you can overlook the blessings of God you see when you know you have joy you can be jobless and still come to church and give God praise when you have joy you can be catching hell but feel like you in heaven when you have joy you can have chaos all around you but still come to church preach boy still come to church and give God maximum praise because the joy of the Lord becomes your strength you don't have joy because of circumstances you don't have joy because of stuff you don't have joy because of your creature comforts your crib your clothes your car your cash but you have joy because you know as long as you live he'll be with you and the moment you die you'll be with him you have joy because you know can't nobody do you like the Lord can I preach like I feel it today and so and so here it is the children of Ephraim they're going on the battlefield and in the day of battle they turn their back and then they run from the enemy because they have no covenant with God they've lost their contact with God and can I give you a scary feeling it is I don't know if I have any police officers in the building but it is scary Pam to go into battle not knowing that you got back up Oh, y'all didn't hear me. It is scary going into a hostile situation, not knowing that when you make your destroy, I got, I got the chief here. It is scary when you go into battle and you call, not knowing that you don't have back. You got to know if I push this button, back up is going to come. You got to know if I call signal for distress, back up is going to come. And every believer, you know, if you got a right relationship with God, the moment you send your distress signal, come on, talk to me, somebody. Help is on the way. And so let's I hold you too long today. Here it is. The Bible says. The Bible says. The children of Ephraim. Verse 9. Being on. Carrying bows. Turn their back. In the day of battle. Out of all the times. To turn your back. Why turn your back? Y'all ain't talking to me. In the day of battle. I can't blame you for turning your back. But don't wait. To the day of battle. Turn your back. Talk to me somebody. That's why you better know who you're going to battle with. You, you, you better have some battle screening process. Help me somebody. You, you, you look good. You, you're fine. Long hair. Nice car, good job, but when battle comes, will you turn your back? Oh, I know you're sexy. I know you're smart. I know you got good 401k. I know you got good money in the bank, but when the battle comes, I need more than beauty. I need more than a bank account. I need somebody that's going to have my back in the battle. I wish y'all let me preach like I felt it this morning. The, the, the Bible says they, they made another mistake. And this mistake, I dare say, is probably one of the most crucial mistakes you can make. They, 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 they didn't stay in covenant with God. Tell you never stay in covenant. They didn't stay in contact with God. But then look at verse number 11, 10. Verse 11, they didn't. Stay conscious of God. Tell you never, you got to stay conscious of God. It's right here in the text. The Bible says they, they, they forgot. Lord, help me, Jesus. They, 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 they forgot. They, they tell you never, don't, don't forget. They, Lord, let me preach. They, they, they forgot his works and his wonders. Watch this. That he had shown them that they, they, they forgot some stuff it, it is as if they deleted everything off the hard drive of their mind it, it is as, as if 
in an effort to create space for new data. They deleted the hard drive and got rid of every past miracle, every past marvelous work. It, it is as if they showed up on the battlefield with spiritual amnesia. <laughs> Lord, let your boy preach. It is as if they, they, they showed up on the battlefield completely forgetting everything that God had done. And it wasn't like God hadn't done wondrous things for them because when you keep reading the text, the Bible specifically says some of the things that he did. And when you read from verses 13 down, you'll discover that God got them through some tough times. Look at what he says. He says he divided the sea and caused them to, buy, to pass through it. And he made the waters to stand up as a heap. And in the daytime, he also led them with the cloud and all of the night with the pillar of flour. Then he claved the rocks in the wilderness and he gave them something to drink out of the great, are y'all hearing me? He brought streams out of the rocks and caused waters to run down like a river. But they weren't grateful because after doing all of that, they still turned around and sinned even more. And what they did was they took uh, amen, forgot about the provider of the past. They went to the battlefield uh, forgetting that this wasn't the first battle they had to face. They went to the battlefield facing opposition failing to realize that this wasn't the first time they've had opposition they went to the battlefield facing a difficult situation forgetting the fact that this wasn't the first difficult situation that they had to face in fact when you look at press the rewind button of their past all of their life God had been with them all of their life God has been making ways out of no ways can I park there for a moment and to suggest that one of the reasons why we have the inability Barry to face the battles and the giants of our life is because we forget all of the wonderful things that God has done for us in the past. I know you're going through a tight spot right now but guess what this ain't the first time you've been in a tight spot. I know that things are kind of confusing now but guess what this ain't the first time you've been confused I know that things are are kind of chaotic now but guess what uh, this ain't the first time Indra you've been in a chaotic situation uh, so what you have to do is this you have to learn how to press the rewind button of your mind and remember every blessing uh, that God has provided for you you have to remember every mountain that God has let you get over you have to remember every valley that God has allowed you to tunnel through you have to have a faith out here your neighbor have a faith found and in your faith found stop fouling past deliverances in your faith found stop fouling the times he makes way out of no way in your faith found start recording the times when he dries your eyes and when the devil comes up against you and tries to make you feel that you cannot make it what you then have to do is this you then have to go to your found and tell the devil this ain't the first time I've ever had to walk the floor this ain't the first time I've had to cry these tears it's not the first time I had sickness in my body it's not the first time I had to bury a loved one it's not the first time I've had trouble on my job it's not the first time my bills have been behind and my money has been spent and the last time my bills were behind you made a way out of no way the last time I got sick in my body it was you God that healed me the last time I was confused it was you God that was a mind regulator and if it did it last time what makes me think I can't do it now so I don't know who I'm talking to but I stop by the night to tell somebody that you ain't got to run from your battles you don't have to flee from the fight but God has given you everything that you need to conquer to conquer the adversary and that do me a favor turn to your neighbor and look your neighbor right in the face and say neighbor don't run from the battle don't flee from the fight but learn how to stand and face adversary. Uh, learn 
how to stand and face the conflict. Learn how to stand and take the licking. Learn how to stand and hang on in there. Well, Pastor Jackson, tell me how to stand. Paul said, when you stand, stand with the helmet of salvation on. Stand with the breastplate of righteousness on. Stand with the armor of God on. With the shield of faith. With the sword of the spirit. With your feet nailed to the gospel. With the girdle of truth around your loins. But above all, praying always. When you fight, you got to pray that God will make a way. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but I believe somebody today know without a doubt that God will make a way. If you know that he will make a way, turn to your neighbor. Look your neighbor right in the face and tell your neighbor neighbor be not dismayed whatever be tied God will make a way somehow tell your neighbor I don't know what you're going through but hang on in there say neighbor don't give up don't give in don't walk out don't fail God will make a way won't it do it I wish I had power yeah won't it do it I wish I had power tell your neighbor say neighbor face the battle face it face it face it face it face it Face it. Face it. Stay in covenant. Stay in contact. Stay conscious. Y'all in here, can I say it one more time? Span. Stay in covenant. Stay in contact. And stay conscious. And if we did those things in the day of the battle, I'm talking to somebody right now. In fact, you know what? I got a couple minutes. It's not 8.30 yet. I want to talk to somebody who's in a battle. It ain't everybody. But baby, I want you to come. I see you. Yes, you. Right there. Yes. Yes, you. Come. I want to pray for you. Yes, you. Yes, you. Come. Right here. Pray. No, not you. You. Yes. Yes, you. Yes, you. Yes, you. Right here. Yes. Come. 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 Right here. Right here. Come right here. Come on right here. Yes, you, yes, don't turn your back. I'm talking to you. Yes, right here. Come on, come on. I see you coming. Come on, right here. Higgs, right here. Come, who else am I talking to? In a battle, in a battle, in a battle. I don't know what battles you may face. I don't know what fights you're in. I don't know what you're going through. Here it is, watch this. Come, 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 come on. I wish y'all would just pray. I see you coming. I see you coming. I see you coming. I see you coming. Listen, please hear me. In order to face these battles God's way, stay in covenant with God. Don't let what you're going through take you out of covenant with God. Your horizontal covenants may break. Stay in covenant with God. Things may go wrong in your life, wrong in your finances. Stay in covenant with God, but then stay in contact with God. During this time, Tanya and Sean, this is the time you pray like you've never prayed before. This is the time. This, baby, this is the sir. This is the time. I've been at a point where I've been so low I didn't know the words to pray I know that sounds strange but I, I, I've been there I, I've been there where I just didn't feel like praying 
But you know what? God built that clause into the word when he said that the spirit will make intercessions for you. That when you don't know how to pray and when you don't know what to pray for and when you don't feel like praying, sometimes just moan or groan and the spirit can take those groanings and interpret your groan. Y'all are hearing me. And then, most important, don't let the devil have your mind. Don't let the devil. Don't let him. Don't listen, babe. Please hear me. Please, please. If you don't hear, if you don't hear nothing else, don't you let the devil have your mind. There's the scripture and the verse. I don't know the scripture right now, but for the writer Paul, I believe he says, "I think myself happy. I, I, I can't, I, I can't let you have my mind. I, I gotta keep reminding myself. He's a waymaker. He's a waymaker. He's a waymaker. He's a waymaker. He, he's a provider. He's a fixer. He's a keeper. He's a deliverer. He's a bill payer." He's a friend. He's a banker. He's a broker. Y'all ain't hearing me. He's a mortgage payer. He's a rent payer. He's a car fixer. Y'all ain't hearing me. He's a gas stretcher. You, 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 you got to remind yourself of that God can do it for you. And if you did those three things, if you stayed in covenant, if you stayed in contact, if you stayed conscious, then when the day of battle comes you'll be able to not retreat from the war but be a conqueror in the war God our Father I pray now for these your children I pray now God that you bless them now I pray God a hedge of protection around there so much so God that no weapon formed against them would prosper I pray now God in the name of Jesus that whatever this battle is whatever this battleground is. I pray for three things. For the covenant not to be broken. For the communication not to be broken. For their conscious state not to be taken away. Keep them conscious. Keep them in covenant. Keep them in contact. Keep them now, God. Keep their minds on things positive. Keep them encouraged spiritually, God. In the name of Jesus, I know that you can. I believe that you will. And we consider it done. In Jesus' name, give God praise. Listen.